Part 7 of Rebels of the Red Planet by Charles Louis Fontenay. Read by Mark Nelson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Rebels of the Red Planet. 13. Brute Hennessy plodded westward through the Xanthi Desert, naked, wearing no Mars suit, his head bare to the thin, oxygen poor Martian air. The two small moons shone in the star-spangled sky above the lone figure, casting fantastic shadows on the sands. But this was not the stupid, shambling brute Hennessy of a few months past. He walked surely and proudly, and the light of intelligence shone in his eyes. He called himself now Dark Kensington. Dark's muscular body had not regained, quite, the firmness and tone it had had before he was shot down at Solus Lacus, but he had recovered greatly from the bloated flabbiness of a few days ago. Most of that had been water in his tissues, and resumption of normal physical activity had wrung it out in short order. As he plodded through the Martian night toward Ultravirus, Dark was remembering, with something of awe, that emotional explosion within him that had occurred on his first sight of Goat Hennessy at the Canfell Hydroponic Farm. It was this sudden, overwhelming recognition that had wrung from his lips the cry, Father! At that moment memory had returned with terrible impact, and he had been overwhelmed by the re-experience of those moments when he had stood before the man he admired and loved as his father, and had seen the bitter realization of rejection by that man ridden with the point of a knife. Now he remembered it all. He remembered his childhood at Ultravirus. He remembered Adam and their experiences together. He remembered their treks through the desert at Goat Hennessy's command. He remembered his slaying of Adam and his acceptance of death at Goat's hands. He remembered that he, Dark Kensington, was Brute Hennessy somehow brought to life once before in the Icaria desert, even as he had himself regained life a second time in the vats of the Canfell hydroponic farm. So Goat Hennessy was his father, apparently. And Oldbeard, the real Dark Kensington, vowed vengeance on Goat. Dark was able to view this with equanimity. He no longer felt any admiration or affection for Goat, whatever relationship might exist between them. But since he was Brute Hennessy, and thus not old enough to be the real Dark Kensington, how and why had he acquired the memories of Dark Kensington? That question remained unanswered. Phobos was setting for the first time that night when Dark reached the great hulk of Ultravirus, manipulated one of the airlocks, and entered its dark corridors. There was no light, and a test of the light switch proved that the electrical system was no longer operating. But Dark knew every inch of this place from early childhood. He felt his way through the pitch darkness to Goat Hennessy's old bedroom. Probing about in the darkness, he discovered that Goat's bed was still supplied with mattress and crumpled blankets. This surprised him somewhat, as any item of cloth on Mars had to be imported from Earth, and was far too valuable to abandon. But, apparently, these things had been left temporarily in Goat's abandonment of Ultravirus and would be picked up by truck later. Deriving a certain humorous satisfaction from taking over the master's chamber, Dark curled up on Goat's bed and went to sleep. He awoke the next morning with the glare of the desert sunlight reflected into the room. He arose, stretched, and yawned. The room was a mess. Goat had left the bedclothing intact but he had turned everything else upside down in packing his personal effects to leave the place. There was still water in the reservoir, an ultra-virus plumbing system was still in operation. Dark bathed. He felt ruefully at the thick stubble of beard that had overgrown his face in the past few days, but Goat had left no shaving equipment behind. Dark made his way down to the big kitchen. There were supplies of canned food there, and he found utensils and ate. He was hungry, but not ravenous, and this surprised him a little, because he had had no food since he started out afoot from the Canfell Hydroponic Farm four nights ago. But he was no hungrier than he would normally be after a night's sleep. As he ate, his eye fell on dishes stacked beside the sink. 
he was startled to notice that water still sparkled on them. He arose and checked them. Yes, they were still wet. There were remnants of fresh food in the garbage can. People, here? Camping out? Or, more likely, someone passing through the desert who had taken shelter here for the night. But he thought he would have heard the roar of a ground car leaving. Thoughtfully, Dark finished his breakfast. It occurred to him that perhaps some members of the Phoenix had taken refuge here after fleeing Mars City. But most of them did not even know of the existence of Ultravirus, much less its location. At any rate, there was no reason to assume that anyone who happened to be here would be unfriendly to him, in case they met by chance. He saw no reason to worry about it. Finishing breakfast, Dark went down to the storeroom and picked out three Mars suits, for Old Beard, Happy, and Shadow. There was a large-sized suit there that he thought might accommodate Happy's bulk, but he wondered how Shadow, with his flat build, was going to manage one. Nakedness felt quite natural to Dark, especially since he remembered his identity as Brute. But it occurred to him that it would look peculiar to anyone he might meet before leaving Ultravirus, or for that matter, on his way back to the Canfell Hydroponic Farm. So he donned a Mars suit himself, leaving off the helmet. Carrying the other three Mars suits, he went down the corridor to the motor pool. Dark remembered that Goat had always kept four ground cars on hand. There were three here now, all in advanced stages of dismantlement. At one of them, a small figure in black tunic and loose trousers was bending over, head and arms plunged into the bowels of the engine. Dark hesitated. He had found his intruder, perhaps a traveler who had run into engine trouble in the desert and had fortuitously been near enough to take shelter here while making repairs. But again, there was no reason to anticipate unfriendliness. Carrying his Mars suits, Dark walked up to the ground car, overhearing a muffled bit of profanity as he approached. The unfortunate mechanic evidently heard his footsteps because he was greeted with, I wish to Phobos you'd stay down here and try to help me, instead of spending all your time snooping around this deserted shack. The voice was muffled, but it was definitely feminine and definitely irritated. Dark grinned and replied drolly, I'm sorry, but this is the first time you've asked me to help you. With an audible gasp, the woman disentangled herself, in dangerous haste, from the ground-car engine and faced Dark. They stared at each other in mutual shocked recognition. There was Dark Kensington, bearded, his arms full of Mars suits, and there was Maya Kara Nome, sleeves rolled up, her lovely face streaked with grease. Dark's jaw dropped. Maya's lips formed a round, astonished O. Oh. Then, with a squeal, she hurled herself on him, throwing her arms around his neck. Dark staggered back, overwhelmed by Mars suits, an abundance of wriggling femininity, and a babble of happy and completely unintelligible words gushed against his bearded cheek. He managed to disentangle himself by the dual process of dropping the Mars suits and holding Maya forcibly at arm's length. She gazed up into his face, her own awed and radiant, and was able to reduce her own words to connected sentences. "'You are not here,' she said positively. "'You can't be. You are dead. I saw you killed. You must be one of the ghosts of Ultravirus.' She wriggled free and threw her arms around his neck again, announcing happily, "'But you're a solid, comfortable ghost, and I love you.' Again Dark managed to get her at arm's length and looked down seriously into her face. "'Did I hear you correctly?' he asked soberly. "'Did you say you love me?' "'I did, and I mean it. Oh, Dark, how I mean it!' He pulled her to him. He kissed her gravely, then he held her close in his arms while she rested her head contentedly against his shoulder. "'What?' he asked at last. "'Are you doing here tinkering with a ground car?' "'Newell and I were on our way to Mars City by helicopter when it failed and crashed,' she explained. 
This was the only place near enough for us to make it afoot, and the Marsuit radios don't have the range to call for help. We've been here more than two weeks now, trying to repair these ground cars." She looked at the machine she had been working on and shook her head ruefully. "'I don't think any of them can be fixed,' she said. Newell, it turns out, doesn't know a damn thing about machinery, but I was taught a good deal about mechanics when I was trained as a terrestrial agent. Even with three ground cars to supply parts, there are some things missing that I don't think I can jury-rig substitutes for." She turned back to Dark. "'But you're dead!' she exclaimed. "'I know you are, because we carried your body with us to the Canfell Hydroponic Farm. How in space can you be here, alive and kissing, when you made such a beautiful corpse?' Dark explained the circumstances to her, how he had awakened in the vat, how he had been able to breathe under water how the sight of Goat Hennessy had revived in him the memory of his identity as brute, how he had been able to walk across the desert without a Mars suit. "'If you're Brute Hennessy, I know why you aren't dead,' she said, when he had finished. "'We fell in with a party of Martians on our way here, and they told me about certain embryonic changes they made on you and Adam before Goat kidnapped your mothers and brought them to Ultravirus. Krill, he's the Martian I talked to, said that these alterations not only permit you to live in a free Martian environment, but give you extraordinary regenerative powers. They must be extraordinary, if they permit me to come to life again after being stabbed in the heart and having my belly burned out with a heat gun, observed Dark. That's because your tissues aren't dependent on oxygen carbon combustion, explained Maya. According to Krill, when oxygen is no longer available to you, your cells utilize direct solar energy. That would prevent your tissues from dying while the damaged area of your body is under repair." She looked at him in sudden, awed realization. "'It would seem, darling, that you're virtually indestructible,' she said. Dark laughed. "'Perhaps so,' he said but I don't hanker to experiment along those lines any more than necessary. Dying is a very unpleasant experience, even if I do come to life again." "'Oh, Dark,' said Maya, remembering, "'I'd like for Quirrell to see you, and maybe he'll give us some more information. They came back here three days ago, and for some reason have just been hanging around outside, under the walls. Let me get on a Mars suit, and I'll take you to him. Here, put on one of these," suggested Dark, picking up the one he had selected for Old Beard. Maya wriggled into it. The Martians, she said, were on the other side of Ultravirus, so they left the motor pool and walked down one of the long corridors together, Maya clinging to Dark's arm with one hand and carrying her Mars helmet under her other arm. They were halfway across the big building when Newell Eli appeared around a corner about thirty feet ahead of them. He stopped, staring, at the sight of Maya's companion. "'Maya,' he began as they neared him, "'who?' Then he recognized Dark. With a terrified yelp, Newell turned and raced back down the side corridor at top speed. They heard the clack-clack of his heels on the stone floor, fading in the distance. Dark and Maya stopped and looked at each other. It must have been quite a shock to him, too, to see you risen from the dead," she said. I don't believe he's as happy to see you as I was, Dark. No, his joy seemed considerably mitigated," replied Dark gravely. But, Maya, this raises a rather serious question which hadn't occurred to me before, in the happiness of our reunion. What's that, darling? You're a terrestrial agent, and as such, you put me under arrest. It's true you tried to free me later, but didn't you tell me that night that you were engaged to marry this man, Newell Eli?" "'Yes,' she admitted in a small voice, "'but—' "'I haven't had the pleasure of meeting the gentleman before,' continued Dark, still in his same grave tone. "'But you and he were going back to Mars City together, and for some reason, it occurs to me that you and he plan to be married as soon as you could get there." Maya was somewhat stunned at this evidence of mind-reading. 
That's true, she said in a very small voice. Now, said Dark, you tell me that you love me. You must admit that the question raised by this is rather serious. Does this declaration of love, which I assure you is reciprocated completely, imply a radical change in your past course of action? Or, since you're still a terrestrial agent, can I expect to be arrested again as a preliminary to your joining Mr. Eli in the holy state of matrimony?" Maya looked up into his face and burst out laughing. "'I may have put it jokingly,' protested Dark, a little taken aback, "'but I'm serious, Maya.' "'I know you are,' she giggled. "'That's what makes it so funny. Answering you in the same vein, Mr. Kensington, I don't intend to put you in double jeopardy.' Dark raised his eyebrows quizzically. "'I arrested you, and you were killed resisting arrest,' she explained mischievously. I've discharged that duty as a terrestrial agent, so I don't think I'm either required or entitled to arrest you again. And, as for the other, well, I am a little sorry for Newell, but I do love you, and I won't marry Newell since you're alive. But I can't marry you, Dark." Dark was stunned at this. "'Why not, Maya? You mean because you're a terrestrial agent?' "'No, it isn't that. I'm planning to resign as an agent as soon as I get back to Mars City, and that wouldn't stop me anyway. The reason I can't marry you is simply that you haven't asked me." Dark laughed, a rollicking, relieved laugh, and swept her into his arms. "'Maya, darling, I ask you now,' he exclaimed, "'will you marry me?' "'Yes, Dark,' she answered demurely. She leaned back in the circle of his arms and looked up into his face, seriously. "'Whither thou goest, I will go,' she said, very quietly. "'If you're a rebel, Dark, I'll be a rebel, too. I want to be with you and help you in whatever you do.'" 14. Dark and Maya sat with their backs against the wall of Ultravirus, and Creel squatted before them towering huge above them. A little distance away, the other three Martians were grouped, playing some sort of game, doing some sort of work, or participating in some sort of joint demonstration. Dark could not be sure which. Quill boomed out a long, rolling sentence, and Maya broke into laughter. She turned to Dark and translated. He said he didn't understand why I'm wearing a helmet when you aren't. I explained that I have to wear a helmet to breathe, and he said that, since you and I are alike, it appears that we dress alike. So you see, darling, even the Martians recognize that we're made for each other." Dark shook his head in wonderment. "'No human has ever been able to figure out Martian thinking processes, and I doubt that one ever will,' he remarked. "'This is the Martian who explained to you the physiological structure that permits me to live without oxygen, and yet he asks a question like that. There is one thing that puzzles me," said Maya, curiously. Without a helmet you can't use your Mars suit heater, and you said you walked here naked. But the temperature out here right now is well below freezing. Aren't you cold?" No, answered Dark. I get cold in temperatures that are uncomfortable to anyone else when I'm in a dome or a building and breathing. But out here, when I'm not breathing, I'm aware of temperature changes but they don't cause me any discomfort. It must be that switching to direct utilization of solar power alters my reactions to temperature." Well, said Maya, I can understand that utilization of solar power when you're in the sunshine, but how can you keep operating when you're in shadow, or at night, and not breathing? I don't know. Maybe Krill does. Maya asked the Martian and relayed his answer to Dark. Creel says that you store excess energy in the tissues, very much as the Martians store oxygen. In a sense, direct sunlight's your generator, and it charges your batteries for power when it isn't operating. Now, Dark, why don't you ask him anything you want to know about your origin, and I'll act as your translator?" All right, agreed Dark. But first, it was among Martians that I awoke when I returned to life the first time in the Icaria Desert. 
That's pretty far away, and I understand Martians have a weird sort of sympathetic communication among themselves. Does he know anything about how I got there?" Maya talked with Krill and translated. Krill is one of the Martians I saw come by here and pick up your body the morning after Goat killed you and threw your body out in the desert. Krill says they recognize you from your genetic pattern, and don't ask me how they did this, as being the one they had completed embryonic alteration on years before. So they picked you up and took you with them to give you a chance to regenerate and revive. But how and why did I turn up after my revival with Dark Kensington's memories? He says they gave you a memory pattern by a deep telepathic process, answered Maya after talking with Krill. Because your memory pattern as brute was of no value to you in meeting a new environment. It seems that there was some blockage in the operation of your brain as brute, because of a slight fault in the embryonic alteration and they corrected that before you revived. But why Dark Kensington's memory pattern? asked Dark. It turned out to be a valuable one for me, but I've met the real Dark Kensington since then, and he's a much older man. Why did they choose his memory pattern? Maya talked with Krill. He says names mean very little to them, she said then. That's something I learned as a child that Martians often interchange their names, and the names evidently refer to a state of experience and being rather than to a specific individual. He says that the memory pattern they chose to give you was that of your father." Dark stared at her, stunned. "'Then,' he said slowly, "'Old Beard is my father. I should have known. I think I felt it. I'm not surprised if you did," said Maya. From what Krill tells me, Dark, this prenatal alteration they performed on you gave you even more extensive powers than we realized. He says that you have extraordinary extrasensory ability, if you would only make an effort to use it. Oh, I do, do I?" murmured Dark thoughtfully. He looked over at the other Martians, seated in a circle in the morning sunshine. They were taking turns tossing some small polygons, and evidently the object of whatever they were doing lay in the way the polygons fell. Dark felt a sudden surge of power in his brain. He concentrated it, he focused it, and one of the polygons rose slowly from the ground and drifted into the air above the Martians' heads. Dark could feel the strength that went out and raised the polygon, like an invisible extension of himself. Then he felt another force seize the polygon, and it was drawn back firmly and without hesitation to its former place. Dark turned his head back to look at Creel's huge eyes, and at once he was in mental contact with the Martian. Creel was laughing at him. There was no change of expression on Creel's face, but in his mind was the atmosphere of high humor. Creel's thoughts came to him without words, in no language silently but clearly. You have not practiced your power. Experience will be necessary before you can compete with the simplest effort of one of our race." Dark turned to Maya. "'He's right,' said Dark. "'I do have extrasensory powers, but they'll need some development.' "'I know,' said Maya. "'The telepathic voltage in the atmosphere must be very high right now, because even I sensed your effort in lifting that object, and I understood Creel's communication to you.' Maya and Dark took their leave of Creel and went back to Ultravirus. As they did so, Creel and the other Martians arose and began to drift away into the desert, as though they had had a mission in staying here which was now accomplished. I hope you know something about mechanics," said Maya, as they walked down the corridor together. Because if you don't, it looks like we're stuck here for a while. At least I am, unless you can run one of those ground cars with psychokinetic power. No, apparently I'm not that good at it yet," said Dark. Maybe I could teleport in any parts you need. No, wait! I just remembered something. Come with me. They turned off into a side corridor, found stairs, and climbed to the top floor of the building. 
There they followed another corridor until Dark stopped and opened a door. It was the door to a small airlock. Dark led Maya through it into a huge room. A helicopter stood in its center. "'Go did leave it here!' exclaimed Dark joyfully. "'I'd forgotten that he had this. He must have just packed the most necessary things when he left the place, planning to send trucks and a crew back and clean it out later at his leisure. Now if this copter's only in good flying shape, we're set.' He checked the machine over. Everything was in order. "'How do we get it out of here?' asked Maya, curiously, looking around the room. "'That little airlock's too small for a copter to go through it.' "'The roof rolls back,' said Dark. "'Put on your helmet, and I'll show you.' Maya donned her Mars helmet. Dark went to the wall and pulled a switch. Nothing happened. "'I forgot,' he said. "'The electricity's off. Well, let's try something.' Dark concentrated his mind intensely on the movable ceiling. For a moment there was resistance. Then, very slowly, it began to open. A crack appeared in its center, and the air of the room hissed out with the swish of a minor tempest. After that it was easier. The crack widened swiftly and the roof rolled back to the walls, leaving the room open to the heavens. "'All we have to do now is to climb into it and go.' said Dark with satisfaction. You fill the fuel tanks, and I'll run down to the motor pool and pick up those other two Mars suits. One of them is for my friend, Happy, who is very fat, and he couldn't wear either of the emergency suits in the copter." Maya uncoiled the hose from one of the fuel drums in the room and poked it into the copter's tank. Dark left the room, walked down the corridor, and descended the stairs. He made his way to the motor pool. Maya was wearing one of the three Mars suits he had brought down, but the other two were still lying on the floor. He picked them up and started back. He was walking down the first floor corridor, carrying the Mars suits, when there crashed in on his mind a terrifying, silent scream. Help! Dark stopped, appalled. It took him a moment to realize that he was still standing in the corridor. It took him a moment to realize that he actually had heard nothing. The corridor stretched away ahead of him, dim and dusty. There was no movement in it, no sound. It was utterly silent. He stood there in a dim, dusty corridor, in waiting silence, holding two Mars suits under his arms. Help! It was a cry that shrieked in his mind, reverberated in his mind, touching nothing around him, touching not the silent corridor. Maya! Dark's mind went out to her, rode up on swift wings to the room above where she had waited for his return. He was there, in that room, and there was the helicopter. There was no Maya there. But there were figures in the copter, moving. He was in the copter, and there was Maya, struggling and writhing as Newell Eli, in a furious concentration of savage energy, bound her into one of its seats with a length of rope. Dark touched her mind, and her mind grasped his, desperately. "'Dark! He followed us up here, and hid until you left. He crept up behind me and seized me. Hurry, Dark! He's taking me away!' "'Hurry! Down those corridors, up those steps, when Newell already was sliding into the pilot's seat of the copter?' Frantically, Dark grasped at his only chance of reaching her in time. Teleportation. He clamped down with his mind on himself. With a frenzied burst of strength he sought to lift himself bodily, to be there in the copter with them. He put every ounce of energy he possessed into the effort. And he failed. He was standing in the dim, dusty corridor, two Mars suits under his arm, straining futilely toward a place he could not reach. And now he actually heard, with his ears, the muted vibration above him as the copter's engines roared to life. Dark started running. He dropped the Mars suits and ran down the corridor. He leaped up the stairs, two and three at a time. Breathless, his heart pounding, he staggered down the upper corridor and impatiently went through the seemingly interminable process of negotiating the airlock. He emerged into the big room. It was empty. The ceiling was open to the Martian sky, the sunlight poured into the roofless room. 
In the sky, a small teetering object rose and moved away from Ultravirus, its blades whirring a sparkling circle in the thin air. Dark reached out to it with his mind, and again he was in the copter. Newell sat tensely at the controls guiding it. Maya was in the other seat, her arms bound down by her sides, her expression agonized. Newell was aware of Dark's mental presence. Maya sensed it, and her mind turned toward him. Dark! Dark! What can we do? I should have been watching for him. I should have known, after he saw us together, that he would do something. Dark. It was my fault, Maya. I shouldn't have left you alone. I just didn't consider him a factor to be reckoned with, and I should have known better. Maya. What can we do? Newell turned to Maya, and his face was bitter and sullen. His brown eyes were flat with anger. You treacherous witch! I should have known better than to trust you after that trick of trying to help Kensington escape. I wanted to give you a chance, because I thought that, with him dead, you might have recovered from your madness," he said. A change came over his face, a mixture of fear, disbelief, and utter lack of comprehension. "'He was dead,' said Newell, a hysterical note underlying his tone. "'I saw him. You saw him dead, too, didn't you, Maya? How could he be back there with you?' Maya's only answer was a defiant smile. "'There's some explanation for this,' said Newell, more positively. "'I don't know what it is, but I'll find it. That man back there isn't Dark Kensington, because Kensington's dead. Maya, I promise you, I'm going to find out what the answer is, but first I'm going to make sure that you don't cause me any more trouble.' Dark touched Maya's mind. Maya, I'm going to try something here." He moved back. He was outside the copter, near it, keeping pace with it as it flew. It was tilted slightly forward, falling forward through the sky at the pull of its blades. Dark seized the copter with his mind. He tried to drag it back. It hesitated. It quivered. Then it jerked forward and went on. He felt his mental grasp slipping from it. Suddenly he was completely in the big room at Ultravirus, the room with its roof open to the sky. He could no longer be in it. He could no longer touch Maya's mind. He tried. He reached out again. But he failed. He was where he was. He realized he was almost exhausted. The tremendous drain of his efforts on his energy told on him at last. He no longer had the strength to try any more, and Newell and Maya were gone away from him into the Martian sky. Wearily, he turned back and went through the airlock, down the corridor, and down the stairs. There was nothing more he could do now. Newell undoubtedly would take Maya to Mars City. And then? Maya would refuse to marry Newell now, and Dark doubted that Newell could force her. What Newell would do with her, he did not know. Probably some sort of confinement, eventually perhaps a trial. But Newell had no ground or reason to do her any real harm. He would have to try to get to Maya as soon as he could, and that meant intensification of his efforts. But there was only one course he could hope to follow successfully, and that was the course he had planned when he started out for Ultravirus. Only now he could speed it up. He had to have some rest. Then he would pick up three Mars suits and walk back across the desert to the Canfell Hydroponic Farm. End of chapter 14、Part、Eight of Rebels of the Red Planet. By Charles Louis Fontenay, read by Mark Nelson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Rebels of the Red Planet, fifteen. Dark walked across the desert toward the Canfell Hydroponic Farm. He had discarded the Mars suit he had been wearing and substituted for it a light loincloth torn from one of Goat Hennessy's sheets. 
This reverse reaction, in a temperature that would be uncomfortably chilly for a fully clothed man, and descended far below zero at night, resulted from his recognition that he gained a tremendously greater direct influx of energy from the total exposure of his skin to the sunlight. He could feel the energy penetrating his flesh, building up in him, and with this energy the low temperature did not bother him. Behind him, by a rope, he dragged a little two-wheeled cart he had constructed from ground-car parts. It rolled and bumped over the sandy terrain containing all the Mars suits and all the seven heat guns he had been able to find at Ultravirus. It also contained a supply of water in cans. Dark had found that, while he was operating directly on solar energy, he did not need food at all, and he did not need as much water as he did under ordinary circumstances. He probably could have survived two weeks without any water at all, but some water did make him much more efficient. His independence of food and oxygen did not prevent the slow desiccation of his tissues in the dry Martian air. As he walked, only part of his mind was devoted to the routine task of moving across the desert. The remainder of it was free of the limitation of distance, touching and interacting with the minds of three other men. These men were members of the Phoenix. At the Childress Barber College they had been among the instructors, struggling to develop the ESP potentials of their students so that a psychic community of purpose and action might be developed toward the goal of teleporting materials from Earth to Mars. These were the men whose ability at telepathy and psychokinesis had been most fully developed, to the point of practical demonstration. Now, newly aware of the extent of his own inner powers, Dark had conceived a bold plan of action, to which these men's comparable abilities was a necessary contribution. There were three of them, Mantar Falusain at Hesperidum, Pietro Corallani at Mars City, and Cheng Ai Khan at Ophir. Among them, by a vast, intangible network of communication, they discussed strategy and the situation on which it was based. Mantar. We knew of the existence of the Canfell Hydroponic Farm. It was on our charts as a Mars Corp industry, supported by the government. But we thought it was only an industry, producing food. We did not know it was an experimental center. Cheng. We did not know Mars Corp was conducting genetic experiments at all, except those of Goat Hennessy. We kept a casual observation on Goat's work. Our intention was that, if he ever succeeded completely in what he was trying to do, we would make a fast raid with a task force, and appropriate his work to our own purposes." Dark chuckled. Dark. That would have dismayed Mars Corp. But it appears that, as things have developed, this sort of raid must be directed now at the Canfell Hydroponic Farm, to free my father and the Mars Corp slaves there. Old Beard is, after all, the real leader of the Phoenix. If we succeed in kidnapping Goat, we can put him to work for us, but that is not the primary objective. Pietro. Do you plan to take over the Canfell Hydroponic Farm and make it our base of operation? Dark. No. When we attack the farm, they will radio Mars City for help, and we don't possess the force to fight off an all-out government counterattack. I have been in communication with a Martian friend, Krill, and I am informed that the domes in the Icaria Desert, which were used by the original rebels a quarter of a century ago, are still usable, although they will have to be supplied with oxygen, food, and water. I intend for the Phoenix to congregate there, and utilize the help of the Martians in carrying out the embryonic changes which will make your children and mine as I am. A new race, capable of living in the natural Martian environment. Pietro. Will these characteristics of which you speak be inherited, or must the embryonic changes be made in each generation? Dark. They will be inherited because they are changes of the genetic structure. The changes will have to be made on each individual embryo of your children, but their children will be born with these qualities naturally. Cheng. What are your instructions? Dark. How many phoenix are at each of your places? Cheng. 
Twelve at Ophir. Mantar. I would have to count. About twice that many at Hesperidum. Pietro. About seventy-five here, as well as the wives of most of the Phoenix who are married. Dark. Seventy-five? That's more than we had in school. Pietro. Don't forget that the school was there for a long time before you came, and it had many graduates. The government captured between a third and a half of us who were in the school at that time, but there are still probably three to four hundred Phoenix scattered about Mars. Dark. Where are the other three instructors, whom I was unable to contact with this telepathic call? Pietro. They are at Cherax, Nuba, and Ismenius. Their telepathic powers are not as well developed as ours, and they would not hear you unless they were expecting the call. Dark. Cheng, I thought your group was to go to Regina. Cheng. It was, but the Regina airlocks were more effectively blockaded to us than at the other cities. Those who went to the other cities, except those who were caught, had identification establishing them as legitimate residents of those cities. Regina has a peculiar social structure which makes this virtually impossible, except for the Phoenix who are already there and have been there for a long time. We thought of stopping at Zur, but there were no arrangements to care for us there. We went to a dome farm operated by a friend of the Phoenix in Pandora Freedom and stayed there until we could trickle gradually into Ophir. Dark. You had quite an odyssey. Cheng, I want you to bring your twelve in ground cars, with what weapons you can get, and attack the Canfell hydroponic farm. I'll try to break it open from the inside. Pietro. Shall I bring my group from Mars City as reinforcements? Dark. No, twelve will be enough, and the conquest of the farm will depend on speed. Before you can get there with your group by ground car, the government will have a well-armed force there by jet. I want you to load trucks with supplies, gather all the wives, and go straight to the Icaria Desert to establish our colony. I'll direct you telepathically when you reach Icaria, if we aren't already there. Cut across the deserts and lowlands, and stay away from the roads and cities. Pietro. Very well. But we'll have to leave the city vehicle by vehicle, and rendezvous somewhere in the lowland. It will take some time. Dark. Whatever is necessary. Do you know where the chief is? Pietro. He's here in jail, in Mars City. His trial is due in twenty days, and we had planned to rescue him sometime during the trial. Dark. Leave a few good men there to rescue him as soon as you've cleared Mars City and are on the way to Icaria. Has Newell Eli gotten back to Mars City yet? Pietro. I don't know. We can find out. Dark. He has Maya Kara Nome with him. She's the girl who was the secretary at the Barber College when it was raided, and she's one of the Phoenix now. I want her rescued. At the same time, if possible. If not... I'll go to Mars City and do it myself later, but I want to get all of you cleared of the city first. Mantar. What do you want me to do? Dark. The most difficult thing of all. I want you to stay in Hesperidum, and send out all the phoenix you have with you to contact those in other Martian cities. They are to rendezvous at Hesperidum, and then you will gather supplies and form another caravan to join the rest of us in Icaria. Cheng. When shall I move out? Dark. As soon as you can gather your men and material together. But stay out of sight of the farm and don't attack until you hear from me. I should be there within the next forty-eight hours. The instructions given, the telepathic conference faded out, and Dark was a solitary man plodding across the desert, pulling a loaded cart behind him. He came in sight of the Canfell hydroponic farm in just about the time that he had predicted to Cheng, but waited until nightfall to approach it. Phobos was abroad in the east at sunset, so Dark waited a little longer, until the nearer moon plunged beneath the eastern horizon. Deimos was not in the sky this night, and Phobos' disappearance left it near pitch dark. Dark moved across the starlit desert, pulling his cart to the walls of the farm. 
The farm was not a massive, sprawling fortress like Ultravirus, because most of it was underground. The upper floor, in which Happy's masters lived and worked, was just below the ground level and the underground vats were below it, extending considerably beyond it in all directions. The only parts of the farm that projected above ground were its four entrances, small buildings of white stone, each with its own airlock. Dark went through the airlock of the nearest one. These entrance buildings were the barracks of the Tufts, in which they slept at night, secure from the possibility of escape, because no Marsuits were available to them. Dark had moved quietly through a barracks of sleeping Tufts the night he had left the farm for Ultravirus, but this time he had his cart with him. There was no alternative but a bold course. Spearing the light of an electric torch before him, he walked down the aisle toward the barred gate leading into the regions below, pulling the metal-wheeled cart across the stone floor behind him. On all sides of him arose an angry growling and shouting, an upsurge from the many throats of the animal noises that were the tough's nearest approach to human language. Dark moved forward steadily, keeping a telepathic radar out to warn him of any impending attack. The very boldness of his action paid off. Its openness apparently convinced the Tufts that this was merely another unusually noisy case of one of the masters returning to the farm at night, as Dark sensed had occurred often before. Dark was not molested. The barred gate had no controls on this side. Dark operated it psychokinetically. It raised slowly. He pulled his cart through, and he lowered it behind him, and went on down the ramp into the underground cavern. He went straight to Old Beard's hiding place and awoke him. Old Beard greeted him joyously. "'I was afraid something had happened to you. You were gone so long,' said Old Beard. "'I had to walk back,' said Dark. "'None of the ground cars at Ultravirus was in operating condition.' Then there's no chance of the rest of us escaping," said Old Beard disappointedly. We can't get at the ground cars here, and the Mars suits you brought won't help. The oxygen supply of a Mars suit isn't adequate to take us from here to the nearest civilization. I think we can get to the ground cars," answered Dark confidently. I brought heat guns as well as Mars suits. Besides, I have a larger plan now than merely escape. He related to Old Beard all the things that had happened, including the fact that Old Beard was his father. "'I am very happy,' said Old Beard simply, tears in his pale eyes. "'I liked you very much from the start, Dark, and I'm glad that you can bear the name of Dark Kensington rightfully.' When Dark told him of the plan for the conquest of the farm, Old Beard stroked his beard thoughtfully. I'm afraid that the attack from within will depend largely on you and me, although Shadow probably will be able to help effectively," said Old Beard. The jellies aren't very aggressive, and even with a few heat guns, I'm afraid they won't be of much use. How about the Tufts? The Tufts would be fine, if you want to wipe out all the masters and all the jellies and possibly us too. They're vicious and unintelligent and they can't be disciplined or depended upon. "'With the attack from the outside timed right, I think the three of us can handle it,' said Dark. "'How many of the masters are here?' "'Only ten, answered Old Beard. "'And they aren't soldiers, but scientists. But they do have weapons, and they know how to handle them. They have to, in order to keep the toughs from getting out of line.' Perhaps we can whip the jellies up to the point of causing a good deal of initial trouble and confusion, and then the three of us move in at the proper moment after the attack from outside is under way," said Dark. We might even turn the toughs loose on them without weapons. Old Beard gave him a steady gaze from beneath his bushy eyebrows. I don't think we want to use the toughs," he said slowly. I said there are ten masters, and that is correct, but they have a visitor who arrived by copter several days ago. A visitor and a prisoner. A prisoner? Yes, a prisoner who wasn't sent down to the vats, but is kept on the upper floor. This prisoner is a black-haired, black-eyed woman. Maya! Yes, I think the visitor is Newell Eli, and the prisoner is your friend, Maya. 
16. Newell Eli sat with Placer Viceroy, director of the Canfell Hydroponic Farm, in its large, underground dining room, eating lunch. This meal was not the tasteless, gelatin-like food that was fed to the jellies and tufts and sold on the Martian market. It was a meal of thick, juicy steaks from the dome farms around Hesperidum, and vegetables from gardens inside Mars City Dome. "'We've been here better than a week, and she's still stubborn,' Newell said morosely. "'Surely she has the intelligence to realize how ridiculous and impractical is her sudden conversion to a lost rebel cause. I'm half convinced that this Kensington fellow put her under some sort of hypnotic spell.' "'You've been very gentle in your methods of conversion,' said Placer. "'It isn't like you, Newell. If you want quick results, we could turn her over to the Tufts for a while.' "'No, I don't want her hurt. I love the woman and intend to marry her. The whippings and humiliations are as far as I'm willing to go.' "'A peculiar sort of love, if you don't mind my saying so,' remarked Placer. Newell stared at him coldly. "'I do mind your saying so,' he said. "'My personal emotions are not subject to your interpretation. But Martian wives are expected to obey their husbands with deference, and, by Saturn, I'm going to break her of that liberal terrestrial training.' "'You'd have the legal right to take the steps necessary for that, if she were married to you,' Placer pointed out. "'But the little fool refuses to marry me now!' exclaimed Newell, in exasperation. "'If she hadn't refused, do you think I'd have brought her here? But I couldn't take her to one of the cities, except as a prisoner, to be tried for sedition and treason, as long as she expresses this violent and open support of the rebel cause. Whether you consider it love or not, I want the woman for myself. I don't want her imprisoned or executed.' "'Perhaps if she were presented with that alternative, she'd be more reasonable about it,' murmured Placer. "'Don't you think I've threatened her with it? She just says that she'd rather die or go to prison than go back on her convictions and knuckle under to me. If she could only forget that she'd ever met that man Kensington!' "'Well, as for that, it might not be so hard to arrange,' suggested Placer quietly. Newell stared at him. "'What do you mean?' he asked. "'You're not familiar with the details of our work here, are you, Newell?' "'I thought I was, pretty well, but what you just said doesn't strike a chord.' "'As you know, the Tufts and Jellies are originally criminals and vagabonds you have smuggled to us for experimental purposes. One major effect of our initial glandular experiments with them, which makes them into Tufts and Jellies, is that they lose all memory of their past. "'I don't want a flabby woman like a jelly!' exclaimed Newell with a shudder. "'I think we could eliminate the memory, permanently, without any physical changes at all,' said Placer. "'There are some pretty good scientists here. I expect the operation would cut down her thinking ability pretty heavily, though. I think it would still be slightly higher than that of the jellies, but you couldn't ever expect her again to get above the intellectual level of a child of six or eight terrestrial years." "'I don't care anything about an intelligent woman,' answered Newell ruthlessly. "'If she weren't so proud of her intelligence now, I wouldn't have so much trouble with her. I want her as a beautiful woman, which is all a woman has a right to expect from a man, and if she were less intelligent and more tractable, I might be able to train her to become the sort of wife a man of my profession and position requires." Placer speared a bit of steak, casually, with his fork. "'Any time you say the word,' he said carelessly. "'I'll give her the rest of today,' said Newell, with decision. "'I'll work her over again with the whip this afternoon, and if she doesn't break, I'll tell her what she can expect. Then, if that doesn't do the trick, I'll turn her over to you the first thing tomorrow." "'Tonight would be better,' suggested Placer. "'The initial surgery takes only about thirty minutes, and she'd do better to rest a night after that. It alone will remove a great deal of her volitional power. 
The entire series of operations will require about three days. Tonight it is then, said Newell, if she doesn't break this afternoon. Maya sat in her locked room, her tunic and trousers covering the red welts on her back and legs. The tasteless gelatin which had been her only food since their arrival almost gagged her with every spoonful, but she had eaten all her lunch. She needed all the strength she could get to maintain her defiance. She was in the grip of dull, unrelenting pain, physically and emotionally. Her flesh ached from yesterday's beating, and she was sick at heart at the revelation of Newell's essential brutality and callousness. She had thought him a sensitive and intelligent man, and she had admired him for this even after some of his exhibitions of childish temper had disillusioned her as to the glowing nobility which she had at first attributed to him. She had felt a warm attraction to him, and, when she thought Dark was dead, she had been willing to marry him, on the basis not of the passionate love she now felt for Dark, but of a mellow tenderness which she conceived a sound basis for an understanding life together. But now! She shuddered at the thought that she might have married him, and perhaps lived all her life with him, thinking him to be gentle and kind. Whatever happened to her, she felt fortunate that this crisis had brought to her view the hidden side of him, that heretofore had been seen only by his partners in political manipulation and by the unfortunate victims of his prosecution. Her shoulders drooped wearily. She stared across the room. It was as bare as a prison cell, which, intrinsically, it was. There was a glass on the wash-basin. It was made of heavy metal, with no sharp edges. Did Newell think she would commit suicide? Not as long as she knew Dark was alive. Her mind touched the glass. It quivered. It tilted and fell to the floor with a clang. She looked at it with mild curiosity as it rolled into a corner. She hadn't done that for a long time, not since she suppressed it because of Newell's hatred of witchcraft. It was telekinesis. She had had the power since she was a child. It seemed that she remembered using it often, and in rather startling ways, when she was a small child with the Martians. But when she went to Earth, she gradually stopped playing with it, except in small ways when she was alone, because it seemed to make her elders very uncomfortable. Telekinesis was ESP. It did not mean that she had any other ESP powers, but there was her experience in the copter. Her mind reached out. At once, like a shock, she was in contact with Dark. His mind turned to hers at once. Dark. Maya, where are you? Maya. Come into my room, darling. I'm at the Canfell Hydroponic Farm. Are you still at Ultravirus? Dark. No, I'm in the vats below you. I knew you were here, but I didn't know where. I can see your room now, though, and its place in the building. Maya. Can you free me? Dark. Not now. There are four toughs outside your door guarding it. I can't attack them without arousing the masters. Soon, though. Maya. I don't know how I'm doing this. I didn't know I had telepathic powers. Dark. A good many people have them, potentially. They don't have to have been changed as I was. But they usually require development. Maya. I'm just glad I can, to know that you're here. Dark. Maya. Why are you in pain? Maya. Newell has been whipping me, to try to get me to recant on my expressions of support for the rebel cause. There was a white-hot explosion in her brain that almost literally seared her mind. Staggered at its impact, she recognized it as the explosion of Dark's sudden anger. Then she was no longer in contact with him. A hundred feet away, in another room, Newell pulled on a pair of black gloves and picked up a short, thick-lashed whip. Coiling the whip, he stepped out into the corridor and turned toward Maya's room. He met Placer, walking in the opposite direction. "'You're going to make your last try now?' asked Placer. "'Yes,' replied Newell. "'I hope it works. 
Actually, her spirit and quick wit are among the reasons I like the girl. But I don't intend to be defied in this." He proceeded on down the hall. As he started past the barred gate to one of the ramps leading down into the vats below, the buzzer beside it sounded. A jelly was standing behind the gate, fat, pathetic face pressed against the bars. Newell stopped. No one else was in sight in the corridor. "'What do you want?' he asked the jelly. "'Master, I seek entry in answer to the summons,' replied the jelly in a voice that quavered with fright. "'What summons?' "'It was ordered that one of us come above and do a task for the masters,' replied the jelly. "'I am one of those who must work today, and I have come in answer to the summons.' Newell looked up and down the corridor. He saw no one. "'What sort of task?' he asked, reluctant to accept the responsibility of admitting the jelly. "'I don't know, master.' "'Look,' said Newell, "'I'm not a master. I don't know anything about the summons. Someone else will have to let you in.' "'If I'm late, they'll let the toughs whip me,' wailed the jelly pathetically. "'Please let me in, master!' Newell, the whip coiled in his hand, impatient to get to Maya's room, was moved to pity at the creature's plight. Besides, the jellies were harmless, and this one certainly wouldn't be seeking admittance without having been called. "'All right, then,' said Newell, and flipped the switch. The bars grated open, and the jelly came into the corridor. But as Newell reached out to activate the switch and close the gate, the jelly, with surprising agility, slipped between him and the switch. "'What in space?' growled Newell. "'Get out of the way!' The jelly did not move. "'I said, get out of the way!' snapped Newell, shaking out the whip. The jelly cringed, and his eyes were terrified, but it still stood against the switch, its huge, translucent body barring Newell. "'No, master!' it whimpered. Don't shut the gate!" Viciously, Newell slashed the whip across its naked shoulders, and the jelly squealed with pain. Newell raised the whip again. But then, through the open gate, there poured a solid mass of translucent flesh, a horde of naked jellies. Silently, they tumbled into the corridor, filling it from wall to wall, and others behind them pushed to enter as they paused. Wide-eyed, Newell stared at them for the briefest of moments. Then he dropped the whip and fled back up the hall, shouting at the top of his voice. The door at the end of the corridor opened as Newell neared it, and Placer appeared in it. He held up a restraining hand. "'Don't make so much noise,' he snapped. "'There's a conference going on in there. What's the—' Voiceless now, Newell grasped Placer's arm and pointed, trembling, back down the corridor. "'What in space?' demanded Placer irritably, peering at the mass of jellies, pouring out of the gate, and beginning to move hesitantly along the corridor in both directions. "'Jellies!' croaked Newell. "'The jellies are loose! They're attacking us!' "'Soft hunks of blubber!' said Placer contemptuously. "'They can't hurt anybody. I wonder what idiot left that gate open.' "'I did,' admitted Newell. "'I mean, one of them wanted in, and I let him in, and then he backed up against the switch so I couldn't close it, until the others came in. "'I don't know what sort of harebrained idea has gotten into their feeble minds,' said Placer, "'but I can take care of it in short order.' He stepped back into the room, and Newell heard him apologizing to the others for the disturbance. Then Placer reappeared, two whips in his hand, and closed the door behind him. He handed one of the whips to Newell. They're a lot more tractable than that woman of yours," said Placer. Let's go. Placer moved down the corridor toward the slowly advancing jellies, and Newell followed reluctantly, at a respectable distance. "'Get back below!' shouted Placer at the jellies as he neared them. "'You know better than to come up here without permission!' They stopped and milled as he approached them relentlessly those in front trying to hold back and those behind them pushing them on. Placer moved straight up to them and began slashing right and left with his whip. There was a sudden surge forward of the jellies, and Placer was engulfed. 
he vanished in a mass of seething, translucent flesh. Newell stopped, appalled, and began to edge backward. There was a flurry of movement in the forefront of the jellies, and Placer burst out of the group, his hair awry, his clothing torn, his whip gone. He staggered toward Newell at a half-run. "'Get back to the room!' cried Placer. "'I don't know what stirred them up, but they can't be frightened back with whips!' The two men ran back down the corridor and burst through the door, startling a conference group of five of the other masters. "'Heat guns!' snapped Placer. "'Something stirred the jellies up, and they're up here causing trouble. I'll turn the toughs loose on them.' While two of the others hurried out another door for weapons, and a third bolted the door through which the two men had just come, Placer picked up a microphone and switched on the amplifier system that covered every area of all levels of the Canfell hydroponic farm. Into the microphone he gave an animal call, a cry that started out on a low crooning note and rose in volume and intensity until it hurt the ears. He repeated this three times. Then he set the microphone down and turned back to his colleagues, an expression of satisfaction on his face. "'That releases the toughs,' he said. Every tough in the place is free to maim or kill any jelly he sees, without fear of restraint or punishment. That should bring them to heel pretty quickly. End of chapter 16《Of Rebels of the Red Planet》by Charles Louis Fontenay, read by Mark Nelson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Rebels of the Red Planet, 17. Behind the locked door of the conference room, one of the masters passed out heat guns to Newell, Placer, and the other four. If we use these on them at half intensity, I think we can calm them down without killing any of them, said Placer. We'll probably have more trouble beating down the toughs and keeping them from killing all the jellies than we will subduing the jellies in the first place." "'I hope we warned the three at the other end of the hall in time,' said one of the others. "'There hasn't been any word from them.' Placer flicked a switch on the intercom system. "'Touchstone, are you men safe?' he asked. "'Yes, sir,' replied a voice on the other end. "'We locked ourselves in because there aren't any heat-guns we can get to from here. The jellies haven't gotten this far down yet. They seem to be cowed by the toughs at the door to Miss Kara Nome's room, and the toughs are strutting around, getting themselves in the mood for an attack. We've been watching them through the window." "'Good,' said Placer. "'Between the toughs at that end and our heat-guns at this end, we ought to be able to force them back below without much trouble. Are we ready to move out?' A different voice came in over the intercom, the voice of the tenth master, who was on duty in the farm's control room. "'Placer, the screen show three ground cars moving up from the south,' he said. "'I've tried to contact them by radio, but they don't answer.' "'We haven't been notified to expect any government visitors,' said Placer. "'It may be a convoy of travelers off course in the desert, or it could be a wandering party of escaped rebels. Warn them away.' Yes, sir." Touchstone's voice came in from the other end of the hall. The toffs are attacking, Placer. Space, it's awful! Those poor jellies can't stand up to the toffs. Suddenly his voice changed and became shrill with excitement. Placer, one of those jellies has a heat gun! Two of the toffs were just burned down, and the others are falling back down the hall. The jellies are coming on, and I can see the gun in the hand of one of them. Great space, muttered Placer. All right, Touchstone, hold tight and keep that door locked. We'll get to you. He turned to the others. We've got to move out now, he said. Use full intensity and shoot to kill. We'll have to burn our way through those jellies and get to the other end of the hall. Leaving one of the masters at the intercom in the control room, the other six went out into the corridor, heat guns ready. The foremost jellies had advanced almost to the door, and now that they had spread out along the corridor they were not packed so closely together. The six men advanced steadily, leveling their guns. 
They fired intense, almost invisible beams stabbing into the group of jellies. The jellies shrieked in pain, several of them collapsed to the floor with smoking flesh. The others turned in panic and began to crowd back down the corridor, the beams stabbing at them and picking them off one by one. Then, from amid the jellies, a beam struck forth, and one of the masters went down, his face burned away. Placer burned down the jelly holding the heat gun, and the five survivors moved grimly on. On the ramp ahead, Dark and Oldbeard approached the open gate to the corridor, Happy and Shadow following them. "'I wish I had been able to find more heat guns at Ultravirus, said Dark to Oldbeard. "'Only three, besides our four, are spreading them out pretty thin. "'At least the jellies made the break into the corridor, and we've managed to discourage the toughs below from following them up for a while,' said Oldbeard. The bodies of a dozen toughs at the foot of the ramp behind them attested to the rear-guard battle they had fought. That was what had held them up so long. "'If we can hold the corridor and keep the masters bottled up, your friends outside should be able to turn the tide.' "'It will take them a while to break in,' said Dark. "'But I've already contacted Cheng telepathically and told him to move in.' They emerged into the corridor, into a scene of tremendous confusion. All they could see in both directions were jellies, milling about and chattering. The mass seemed to be drifting gradually toward the left, while from the right came shrieks of agony. "'This way,' said Dark, turning to the left. We have to get Maya out of here before we can do anything else." Forcing their way through the jellies, they came to a door. Dark tried it. It was locked. They burned the lock off and pushed it open. Maya was standing back against the wall on the other side of the room, alarmed at the noise in the corridor, frightened at the opening of the door. As Dark and Old Beard came in, and she recognized Dark, she ran across the room to meet them, joy transforming her face. She threw herself into Dark's arms. "'Oh, Dark!' she cried. "'I knew you'd come!' He enfolded her in his arms and kissed her. Then he turned back to Old Beard, his arm around Maya's shoulders. "'Old Beard, this is Maya Karen Nome, said Dark. "'Maya, this is my father, the real Dark Kensington.' "'The older Dark Kensington,' corrected Old Beard. "'I am very happy to meet you, Maya. My son, you have chosen a beautiful woman." Happy and Shadow had followed the other two into the room and were standing against the door, holding it closed. "'Maya, we're going to have to try to hold the corridor until the Phoenix gets here,' said Dark. "'I want you to go with Shadow and Happy down to the vats. You get into a Mars suit, and they'll take you to one of the entrance buildings. I'll tell Cheng to pick you up in one of the ground cars, and then Happy and Shadow can come back here to help us. I'll do nothing of the sort," said Maya flatly. You need them up here now, and I won't leave you. I'm going to stay here and help you. After all, I can handle a heat gun better than any of these jellies. But Maya, I want to know that you're safe. I don't want to be safe until you are. Please let me stay, Dark." All right, Dark surrendered. Shadow, give her your heat gun. The five of them left the room together. They emerged into a scene of incredible carnage. The jellies, with only three heat-guns which they were inept at using, had been no match for the masters. Almost all of the jellies were lying dead on the floor of the corridor, and the remaining few were backed up at the end of the hall to their right. Three of the men were advancing toward these last jellies. The other two, returning to the conference room, already had passed Maya's door and were picking their way back among the scorched, twitching bodies of the jellies. Dark and the others were between these two retreating forces of masters. "'We'll have to try to save those jellies,' decided Dark at once. "'Happy, you and Shadow move back up the corridor and hold the line in case those other two turn back to attack our rear. The rest of us will tackle the three to the right.' They split up and moved off, but they were too late. Dark, Maya, and Oldbeard had advanced hastily no more than ten feet when the last of the jellies at the end of the corridor collapsed under the combined beams of three heat-guns. Immediately the door beyond the dead jellies opened and three more masters emerged. They joined the first three and were given the heat-guns taken from the vanquished jellies. 
Dark stopped and held up his hand, halting the advance of his little group. We're too badly outnumbered now, he said. Let's collect Happy and Shadow and get back down to the vats, where we can hide until the Phoenix break in. The masters had seen them now, and started to move up the corridor toward them in a group, but were still ten or fifteen feet out of heat-gun range. Dark was not surprised to see that one of the group was Newell. Dark and Maya turned back toward the entrance toward the underground vats, but stopped as Oldbeard emitted a growl of recognition. One of the three men who had emerged from the room was skinny, goateed, goat Hennessy, and he was coming forward now in the forefront of the group, a heat gun in his hand. Dark, you and Maya go on without me, said Oldbeard very quietly. I have a score to settle. Dark turned back his mouth open to protest, but Old Beard had already started swiftly down the corridor toward the oncoming group. "'Wait!' cried Dark, and started to run after him. But in his haste Dark tripped over the corpse of a jelly and fell sprawling. In the moments it took Dark to scramble to his feet and recover his dropped heat-gun from the floor, the drama ahead of him flashed like lightning to its conclusion. Old Beard ran down the corridor toward the group of masters, leaping lightly over the bodies of jellies in his path, his gray hair streaming out behind him. "'Goat Hennessy!' he thundered, his voice reverberating from the walls of the corridor. "'You betrayed me and killed my wife. Now the time has come for you to pay for your crimes!' The masters stopped in their tracks, frozen at the sight of this figure of retribution charging down on them. In their forefront Goat stood staring, open-mouthed, not comprehending, until the full impact of Old Beard's words broke upon him. Then, recognition dawning, he squalled in amazement and fear. "'Dark Kensington!' With that cry Goat turned in terror to escape, but Dark was now within range, and the intense beam of his downward chopping heat-gun caught Goat at the base of the skull and swept all the way down his back. Goat Hennessy plunged forward to the floor, dead, his spine burned away. Even as Goat fell, his companions emerged from their paralysis. The beams of five heat-guns focused on Old Beard, and he died in a burst of flame that flared from wall to wall of the narrow corridor. Appalled at his father's sudden death, Dark almost leaped after him, to attack the five survivors single-handed, but Maya grasped his arm. "'No, Dark,' she urged. "'Please, don't!' Realizing on the instant that to die now would only leave Maya at the mercy of the masters and Newell, Dark turned back. He and Maya ran for the door to the ramp leading underground, Dark calling to Happy and Shadow to join them. But Happy, and presumably the invisible Shadow, were well up the corridor, and they too were under attack now. The two masters who had been heading for the conference room had turned back and were now in range of Happy, their heat guns blasting. Happy had remained true to Dark's charge to hold the line against any attack from the rear. Frightened but staunch, he was standing his ground, waving his own heat beam at the approaching pair of masters. But Happy was too unfamiliar with the weapon and too nervous to hit either of his targets. The beams of both masters found him at the same time and, with a woeful shriek that was cut off in a choking gurgle, the unfortunate jelly collapsed to a smoking heap on the floor, quivered once, and lay still. Apparently, from out of nowhere, the unarmed shadow descended like a thunderbolt on one of Happy's killers. The surprised master went sprawling, his heat-gun flying from his hand. Shadow might have vanquished the other, too except that this startled individual, waving his heat-beam wildly in an attempt to catch the elusive, vanishing and reappearing figure, scored a lucky hit. There was a tremendous flare of flame, and the extraordinary form of shadow appeared for the last time, a charred, flat body lying on the floor of the corridor, like the shadow for which he had been named. The whole tragedy ran its course in less than a minute. In that time, Dark and Maya reached the entrance to the ramp, ducked into it, and ran down the incline to the sheltering dimness of the labyrinthine vats. 18. 
Moments later the two groups of masters converged at the gate, two from one direction and five from the other. "'After them!' commanded Placer. "'But stay together. We have to try to hunt them down in the vats, and maybe the Tufts can help us, but we don't want to get separated so they can pick us off one by one.' "'Wait, Placer. There's something you ought to know.' said one of the two masters, who had come from the direction of the conference room. Grady called out a few minutes ago to tell us he had word from Vidanati in the control room. Those ground cars that were hanging around had attacked one of the entrance buildings. Space! growled Placer. There must be a conspiracy involved here somewhere. We better stay up here, then. He pulled the lever beside the gate to the ramp, and it rumbled down and crashed into place. At least those two are trapped below, he said with satisfaction. We can hunt them down at our leisure when we've repelled this attack from outside. If we can take them alive, I'm of a mind to make them pay well for their responsibility in our losing all our experimental jellies. The seven of them went on to the conference room, picking their way among the bodies of the jellies. Placer took over the intercom from Grady. Fidonati, this is Placer, he said. What's the situation?" "'The ground cars attacked the south building,' replied Vidanati. They moved in and concentrated all three car beams on the airlock and burned it through. I counted nine men in Mars suits who left the ground cars and went into the building. Of course, as soon as they started blasting the airlocks, I closed the emergency barrier to block off the downward ramp. "'Obviously, since we still have air in the place,' commented Placer dryly. You'd better call Mars City and get them to send help. I've already done that, said Vidanati. A jet squadron's on its way. Good, said Placer. They can be here in about five hours, and it will take those rebels, or whoever they are, two or three times that long to burn through one of the emergency barriers, even if they blast an opening and bring their ground cars into the building to bring the ground cars' big guns on it. Should I stick out here, or seal all the barriers and come below?" asked Vinanati. The control room was in the north building. "'Stay up there so you can report on what they're doing, unless they start to move toward that building,' instructed Placer. "'If they do, seal the other emergency barriers at once and come below. We can switch to the emergency radio down here to keep in touch with the task force from Mars City and just wait it out underground until they clean up these rebels." "'Good enough,' agreed Vidanati. "'I won't take any chances.' In the vats below, Dark and Maya made their way to Old Beard's hideout, their heat-guns ready, keeping a sharp lookout for tufts. They reached it without incident. Dark looked sadly around the little recess beneath the tangled vegetation, where Old Beard had concealed himself successfully so long from both Tufts and Masters. He had hoped that this reunion with his father would mean many years of companionship between them, once they were free of the Canfell hydroponic farm and had found a haven in the Icaria Desert. But he knew that Old Beard had died in an act that had great meaning to him a savage revenge that had wiped out the bitter memory of the loss of his wife, and had repaid him for twenty-five long years of exile. Old Beard had died nobly. Dark picked up one of the smaller Mars suits. "'We don't know what's going to happen above, and we can't help much by staying inside, now that we can't hold that corridor and bottle them up in a room until Cheng and the Phoenix break in,' said Dark. We'd best get up to one of the exit buildings, get out through the airlock, and get picked up by one of the ground cars. I don't need a Mars suit, but you can put that on as soon as we get above in the building." "'Have you been in telepathic touch with Cheng?' asked Maya. "'Yes. They have already broken into the south building. That's the one I came through when I left for Ultravirus and when I came back. But the Masters let down a heavy emergency barrier on the ramp when they attacked the airlock and we wouldn't be able to get through that. There's a ramp near here that Old Beard told me opens onto the north building. We'll go there, and I'll send a call to Cheng to move over and meet us there." Dark sent out a call to Cheng and received an acknowledgment. He and Maya started for the ramp, unaware that the building which was their goal housed the farm's control room, and the watching Vidanati. Above, a few moments later, 
Vidinati called Placer on the intercom. Placer, they've come back to the ground cars and turned them in this direction, said Vidinati. I'm going to let down the barriers on the ramps from the east and west buildings, sabotage the control so they can't raise them again, and come on down. I'll lower the barrier to this building from the inside as soon as I get past it on the ramp. All right, said Placer. We'll start getting the emergency radio in operation down here. Do a good job, but do it fast, and don't get caught up there by the rebels blasting the airlock. I won't, promised Vidinati. It'll only take me a few minutes, and I can be down the ramp before they can focus their beams on the airlock. In the lead ground car, as the three of them wheeled around and headed slowly for the north building, Cheng turned to one of his companions with a frown. "'I've been trying to get through telepathically to Dark, but I can't reach him,' said Cheng. "'He didn't give any instructions for getting into the building, but they seem to have locked these airlocks by remote control so they can't be operated. We'll have to blast this one as we did the other one, because I don't imagine Dark will be able to open it from the inside. He seemed in rather a hurry to be picked up. Dark and Maya hurried up the ramp toward the north building. Dark had been concentrating too heavily on finding his way through the vats to receive Cheng's telepathic call. They passed the barred gate that opened into the corridors of the upper level, and a few moments later reached the top of the ramp and the gate to the north building. Dark had been prepared to open this by telekinesis, but to his surprise it was already open. They passed through it and emerged into the north building. Dark had never seen one of the ground-level buildings in daylight, as both times he had passed through the south building it had been at night. He looked around the place curiously as they entered. It was about fifty feet square, bare except for the low, hard bunks on which the tufts slept at night. On three sides of it were windows, now closed with heavy steel shutters. The airlock was across the room, opposite the ramp entrance. The fourth wall was blank and apparently shut off a room at the end, because there was a closed door in the center of it. They moved out into the room, and Dark said, "'Slip into your Mars suit, and we'll go out the airlock. I told Ching to bring the ground cars over this way, and they ought to be ready to pick us up by the time we get out.' "'I don't see why we didn't stay down in the vats until the Phoenix break in,' said Maya. "'We were well hidden down there, and there might have been some way we could have helped the Phoenix from inside.' "'Primarily, because I'm not sure now that the Phoenix can break in,' answered Dark. "'I don't know about that heavy emergency barrier the Masters let down on the south ramp, and I was surprised and relieved to find they hadn't dropped one on this ramp, too. If they had, we'd have been trapped below. If they have those barriers on all four ramps, the Phoenix can't stay around long enough to burn through them, because the Masters have probably already called for help for Mars City.' Maya had laid her Mars helmet down on one of the bunks and was pulling the Mars suit on over her tunic and trousers. The door at the other end of the room opened, and a man emerged, a heat gun in his hand. Vidinati stopped in his tracks, startled, at the sight of Dark and Maya. Dark grunted in surprise and reached for his heat gun. Even as Dark freed his weapon, Vidinati fired. The beam missed them, melting away the top of Maya's Mars helmet and setting the bunk aflame. Then, as the beam of Dark's gun swung toward him, Vidinati ducked precipitately back into the control room. "'He got your Mars helmet!' exclaimed Dark. "'We're going to have to go in and flush him out of there, and just hope there's another Mars suit in there, before we can open the airlock.' Heat gun in hand, Dark started for the door of the control room, Maya at his heels. It was then that the Phoenix, the three ground cars drawn up with their heavy guns focused, blasted the airlock of the north building. In seconds, the airlock was burned through. There was no emergency barrier down on this ramp. The heavy, earth-pressured air of the north building whistled out into the desert. As from a punctured balloon, the pressured atmosphere of the entire Canfell hydroponic farm rushed after it, roaring up the ramp, in a moment stripping the vats, the upper level, and the north building. Caught in the tornadic blast, Dark could only cling to a bolted-down cot with one hand and hold on to Maya around the waist with the other. 
As the pressure dropped precipitately and oxygen no longer touched his lungs, he could actually feel his alternate metabolism shifting into gear. He could feel his breathing stop and the glow of solar energy begin to spread through his body. As the wind faded and died, Dark released Maya and rose exultantly to his feet. Down below, he knew, Newell and the Masters were gasping out their lives in the thin air, like beached fish. Their recent attacker, Vidinati, lay half out the door of the control room, his hands clutching convulsively at the floor. "'That's not the way I'd planned it, but it's just as good,' Dark exclaimed. "'We've taken the farm!' Then he remembered. Maya had no Mars helmet. Appalled, struck to the heart, he turned in his tracks. Maya was standing behind him, calmly trying to rearrange her raven hair, tangled by the raging rush of wind. "'What's the matter?' she asked quietly, becoming aware of Dark's intent gaze. "'Maya! You don't have a helmet on! Are you breathing?' She was silent for a moment, apparently examining herself. "'Why, no, I don't believe I am.' she replied, just as calmly. "'How can you? Wait a minute!' Dark sent his mind into the invisible. His probing thoughts fled over desert and lowland, seeking. They found the Martian, Quill, and he recognized that Quill responded immediately. "'Quill, how is it that Maya is able to live in the Martian atmosphere without breathing?' asked Dark telepathically. She is as you, replied Krill. When she was a child, living among the Martians, we altered her physiological and genetic structure so that she also is able to utilize solar energy and exist without oxygen. Why didn't you tell me this before, at Ultravirus? demanded Dark. You did not ask, replied Krill, and the mental contact faded out. Dark turned to Maya, his face alight. "'Darling,' he said, "'our children will need no embryonic alterations. They will be born as we are, able to live under Martian conditions, and never again will either of us ever have to wear a Mars suit.' He felt the questing touch of Cheng's mind. "'Cheng! Are you there, Dark? Dark! Here! Cheng! Are you all right? Dark! We're both fine. We're coming out. Then we'll take off at once for the Icaria Desert, before the Mars City Task Force gets here." He and Maya walked hand in hand through the blasted airlock. The three ground cars were there, waiting. The two of them stood for a moment, before getting aboard the ground cars and looking out together across the red desert toward the sinking sun. Death? Desolation? No, not for them. This was life, and free, bleak beauty for them and their children. The future of Mars was theirs. The End of Rebels of the Red Planet by Charles Louis Fontenay